At the Rose Angel Brothers Center at age of 68, <laughs> about a year by, uh, I reached out to get my hat. <laughs> and it's right here by the little town of Brownstown, and a little town it is, on I 70 in Illinois. About uh, 70 miles from St. Louis, about 30 miles from that big cross down in Ethel. And we're here for our Bible study again this Thursday evening at 7.30, as we are always on Thursdays, whenever we can, if I'm out of the truck show or something. And we are in the book of Judges, in chapter 11, and about the a midpoint of the story of Jabba. And here we will see his great uh, victory. And uh, as a... Uh, Foil to his joy in that, a distressing vow which he makes. But before we begin, we're going to ask the Lord to bless us and bless this congregation of ours. Lord God, I thank you for this forgiving word that you said before us. And I ask you, Lord, to enliven that spirit in our hearts that leads us into all wisdom. It gives us a hunger for your word. That speaks to our hearts in our walk with you, showing us that which you have laid up in your word for each one of us. I ask you, Lord, to bless us here in our communion, as you did in our going out last time. And I thank you, Lord, that you have brought us here again. All uh, hail and healthy and ready to participate in your word. And most of all, I thank you for your Son, Jesus Christ, the substitutionary sacrifice on the cross, but our salvation through faith in him. And in his name I pray, and amen. Now, here we are at the end of chapter 11, and the section we'll go over is the whole end of the chapter from verse 29 to 40, which we'll first read. And then we'll talk about it some. 
and everybody feel free to jump in and say stuff and ask questions and make comments. So starting in verse 29 of Judges chapter 11. Then the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jephthah, and he passed over Gilead and Manasseh, and passed over Mizpah of Gilead, and from Mizpah of Gilead he passed over unto the children of Ammon. And Jephthah vowed a vow unto the Lord, and said, If thou wilt, said, If thou shalt without fail deliver the children of Ammon unto my hands, then it shall be that whatsoever cometh forth of the doors of my house to meet me, when I return in peace from the children of Ammon, shall surely be the Lord's, and I will offer it up for a burnt offering. So Jephthah passed over unto the children of Ammon to fight against them, and the Lord delivered them unto his hand. And he smote them from Eror, even till thou come to Mineth, even twenty cities, and unto the plain of the vineyards, with a very great slaughter. Thus the children of Ammon were subdued before the children of Israel. And Jephthah came to Mizpah, unto his house. And behold, his daughter came out to meet him with timbrels and with dances, and she was his only child. Beside her he had neither son nor daughter. And it came to pass, when he saw her, that he rent his clothes and said, Alas, my daughter, thou hast brought me very low, and thou art one of them that trouble me. For I have opened my mouth unto the Lord, and I cannot go back. And she said unto him, My father, if thou hast opened thy mouth unto the Lord, do to me according to that which hath proceeded out of thy mouth. For as much as the Lord hath taken vengeance for thee of thine enemies, even of the children of Ammon. And she said unto her father, Let this thing be done for me. Let me alone two months, that I might go up and down upon the mountains, and bewail my virginity, I and my fellows. And he said, Go. And he sent her away for two months. And she went with her companions, and bewailed her virginity upon the mountains. And it came to pass, at the end of two months, that she returned unto her father, he did with her according to his vow, which he had vowed. And she knew no man, and it was a custom in Israel, that the daughters of Israel went yearly to lament the daughter of Jephthah, the Gileadite, four days in a year. And that takes us to the end of the chapter. Now, the uh, children of Ammon hadn't listened to Jephthah. He made a pretty good case that they had no grievance against Israel and that Israel had not done them wrong. But they were obstinate against him. And so Jephthah, in an excellent spirit, being the spirit of the Lord, uh, improved upon that spirit in verse 29 by immediately as soon as negotiations broke down, going into the field against them, uh, the choice for the leader of the people uh, had a clear call to engage, being unanimously risen to his position. The king of Ammon's deafness to his proposals gave him just cause to engage, and the spirit of the Lord came upon him and imbued him with that power from on high to make that engagement. God confirmed him in his office by placing his spirit upon him, assured him of success in the undertaking, and he doesn't lose any time. With great resolution, he takes the field. And then God gives him that success. And uh, he did well in that as well. Starting in verse 32, the Lord delivered the Ammonites into his hand, giving judgment upon them in favor of his righteous cause. And then, having routed their forces, he pursued them through their cities, put to the sword everyone he found in arms, disabled them thereby from molesting Israel in the near future. There in verse 33. And so he has his victory, and he pursues his victory with zeal. And now we come to his vow. 
but he's going out from his house into this undertaking to set his life and others on the line for his nation. He has a prayer to God for God's presence with him. And he makes a, a secret, solemn vow or religious promise to God. If God <clears throat> can bring you back by his grace, the conqueror, then whatsoever comes out of his house to meet him is going to be devoted to God and offered up for a burnt offering. At his return, his victory, news of that coming before him, his daughter meets him with expressions of joy, tendrils and dancing. Now, there are some good lessons thrown out of this story. First of all, there can be some of remainder, some little bit of distrust and doubt, uh, even in the hearts of true and great believers. As we remember, Jephthah is among those men of faith that are listed in the book of Hebrews as being the truly great men. And yet, uh, he still wanted to make a vow and ask the Lord, I will do this if you will aid me. It's also very good, on the other hand, that if you expect some mercy from the Lord, some gift, to make a vow of some acceptable service to him, not to purchase what you desire, but as an expression of your gratitude to him. In Leviticus 27, verse 2, we read, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, When a man shall make a singular vow, the person shall be for the Lord by thy estimation. Now, as well, when making a vow, we see here that there is a, a great need to be cautious and well advised in making a vow. In Ecclesiastes, chapter 5, starting in verse 2, we read this wisdom. Be not rash with thy mouth, and let not thine heart be hasty to utter anything before God. For God is in heaven, and thou upon earth. Therefore, let thy words be few. For a dream cometh through the multitude of business, and a fool's voice is known by a multitude of words. When thou vowest a vow unto God, defer not to pay it, for he hath no pleasure in fools. Pay that which thou hast vowed. Better it is that thou shouldest not vow, than that thou shouldest vow and not pay. Suffer not thy mouth to cause thy flesh to sin. Neither say thou before the angel that it was an error, Wherefore, God should be angry at thy voice and destroy the work of thy hands. So, Jephthah's harm here can be our warning in the matter of valid. Deuteronomy 23 and 22 tells us that if, but if thou shalt forbear to vow, it shall be no sin to thee. You don't have to make special vows. They are, after all, special vows. <laughs> you don't have to do those things. So consider what you're going to vow and what you can do. Make sure that you can do it. Now, next we see that when you solemnly vow to God, you have to conscientiously perform it, as was mentioned in Ecclesiastes or in Psalm 76 in verse 11. Vow and pay unto the Lord your God, that all that be round about him bring presents unto him that ought to be here. Or in verse 35, here in uh, the chapter we're reading, where Jephthah says, I have opened my mouth unto the Lord, and I cannot go back. Now, aside from Jephthah, we also have a daughter in this. And we can see that it's very becoming to children to obediently and cheerfully submit to their parents in the Lord. And that our friends 
groups are also our groups. She goes to bewail her fate to her companions. They join with her in her lamentations in verse 38. And we see that a heroic zeal for the honor of God, and here the honor of Israel, even if it's uh, matched with indiscretion, it is worthy to be had to perpetual remembrance. The daughters of Israel have an annual uh, solemn occasion to preserve the honor of the memory of Jethro's daughter. It's a rare instance that someone prefers the public instant, the public interest uh, before themselves and was not to be forgotten. Uh, the victory, that common benefit to all of Israel, was such a joy to her that she was willing to be offered as a thank you offering for it and uh, thought her life well bestowed for such a great occasion. And that brings us to chapter 12. Let's see what we've got. Okay. This is the Ephraimites, yes. The Ephraimites come around again God problems. You remember they caused problems with Gideon as well. In fact, we'll probably be referring to him here. Uh, in the beginning, uh, verses 1 to 7, we're going to have an encounter with the Ephraimites, and unfortunately, there will be bloodshed on this occasion. And we'll see the conclusion of uh, Jephthah's life in Jephthah. And after that, there are some uh, other judges that are mentioned at the end of the chapter, three of them. Would you like to read it? One to seven? Yep. Judges chapter 12, 1 to 7. The men of Ephraim gathered themselves together, and went northward, and said unto Jephthah, Wherefore passed thou over to fight against the children of Ammon? Didst not call us to go with thee? We would burn thine house upon thee with fire. And Jephthah said unto them, I and my people were in great strife with the children of Ammon, and when I called you, you delivered me not out of their hands. And when I saw that you delivered me not, I put my life in my hands, and passed over against the children of Ammon, and the Lord delivered them into my hand. Wherefore then have you come up against unto me this day to fight against me? So Jephthah gathered together all the men of Gilead and fought with Ephraim, and the men of Gilead smote Ephraim, because they said, The Gileadites are fugitives of Ephraim among the Ephraimites and among the Manasites. And the Gileadites took the passages of Jordan before the Ephraimites, and it was so that when those Ephraimites, which were escaped, said, Let me go over, that the men of Gilead said unto them, Art thou an Ephraimite? If he said, Nay. Then said they unto him, Say now, Shibboleth. And he said, Shibboleth. For he could not frame to pronounce it right. Then they took him and slew him with the passages of Jordan. And there fell at that time of the Ephraimites forty and two thousand. And Jephthah judged Israel six years. Then died Jephthah the Gileadite, who was buried in one of the cities of Gilead. displeasure that Jephthah didn't call them for his assistance, they say, that they can share in the triumph. There in verse 1. Uh, proud men think that uh, any honor that goes to someone else is lost to them. <laughs> that guy over there is doing well. I'm supposed to do well. That's he's making me look bad. Why is he doing that? Why he, is he you know, like that? five or six hundred of you to give a little bit, and we'll have it done. 
<laughs> so the Ephraimites had the same sort of quarrel with Gideon back in chapter 8. Uh, he was of Manasseh on their side of the Jordan. And Jephthah was of Manasseh on the other side of the Jordan. So Ephraim and Manasseh uh, are really nearer akin than most of the other tribes. They're both the sons of Joseph, but they're more jealous of one another than any of the other tribes as well. Uh, Jacob gave Ephraim the preference, probably looking far forward to the kingdom of the ten tribes, when Ephraim was the head of that after the revolt from the house of David. But they weren't content with uh, the honor they'd been given. Or, uh, they were displeased that Manasseh had any honor in the meantime. It said that a brother offended is harder to be won in a strong city. And contention among brethren is as the bars of the castle. So the anger of the Ephraimites again, it was causeless. They asked, why did you not call us to go? Well, it was the men of Gilead that made it to their captain, not the men of Ephraim. He didn't really have authority to call them. It's also cruel and outrageous. They got together in a violent mob, went over the Jordan as far as Mizpah in Gilead, for get to live, and couldn't satisfy themselves with the burning house and him in it. Uh, resentments that have little reason for them commonly have the most rage in them. Or uh, another truism, if you're ever speaking with someone in debate or argument, is the more arrogant a person is, the more likely they are to be wrong. And the more angry they are, the more likely it is to know that they're wrong. Now, Jephthah vindicates himself. He didn't try to pacify them, as Gideon had done in the case. But he does take care to justify himself in verses 2 and 3. He makes it out they had no cause at all to quarrel with him. Because first of all, he wasn't pursuing glory when he engaged in that war. He did it because it was a necessary defense of the country. And also, he had invited the Ephraimites to come and join with him. They were any obligation to pay respect to him, but they had declined. He says, I called you, and you delivered me not out of their hands. And the enterprise to go and fight the Ammonites was hazardous. And uh, greatly did he put himself in or his life in his own hands, he says. But they had reason to pity him more than to anger him. He was the man who had to go out the front lines and do the fighting. And, lastly, he didn't take the glory of success to himself. That would have been uh, less than uh, thankful to what God had done for him. He gives all the glory to God. The Lord delivered them into my hands, he says. Now this answer, uh, not as soft an answer as Gideon's, but a just one, didn't prevail to uh, turn away their wrath. So he took care to defend himself and to chastise them with the sword by virtue of his authority as Israel's judge. The Ephraimites had quarreled with Jephthah, but when his neighbors and friends appeared, they also abused them. There in verse 4, they said, You Gileadite, that dwell on this side of Jordan are fugitives of Ephraim. They're just the dregs of the child of the tribes of Joseph. Ephraim is the chief, and they're 
resto do fator. Fugitive de Damasco. Uh, an abusive term that calls evil names uh, it is quite a mischievous thing. Uh, in James chapter 3 and verse 6, we can read, And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members that defileth the whole body, and setteth on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire of hell. Uh, the insult that they gave the Iliadites certainly raised their haggles. The indignity that was done to them, as well as to the captain, they had put over them. And they would well want revenge for that. So, in verse 4, they went out and routed them in the field. And, in verses 5 and 6, cut off their retreat thereby completing their defeat. It, it was cunning of them uh, that although the Ephraimites spoke the same language as they did, uh, they realized that they had a little bit different dialect uh, in pronouncing the letter Shin, like Samak. Uh, they would ask them whether or not they say shibboleth, and they would say sibboleth, and Ness is an Ness age. This reminds me of something much closer to us in history. I remember a journalist who was in Northern Ireland when there was a, a lot of stuff going on in Northern Ireland. There were people fighting up there, the Protestants and the Catholics, the terrorist activities within the country. And he wanted to know uh, what your average man on the street thought and what they really thought about each other. And so he noticed that there were always kids out playing in the street. And kids usually hear their parents. And uh, they usually uh, tell you just what they hear. So he went around to these children and he started asking them. He said, how do you tell the difference between a Catholic and a Protestant? What's the difference between? If some kid came up here and didn't know it, how would you know? What is this difference? And they thought about it, and every time he asked about this, he got the same answer pretty much. He said, you'd ask them to repeat the alphabet. Because if they were a Catholic and went to Catholic school and they got to the letter H, they'd say H. And if they were a Protestant, they would say H with a Irish accent. <laughs> that's how you know the difference. And that's why they were chucking bombs at each other. Now, let's observe the position back with Jephthah. First, the righteousness of God is punishment. They're proud, Ephraimites, they're passionate, and here in several instances they answer for their sin. Now, they're proud of the honor of their tribe, but now they're brought to be ashamed and afraid of their own country. When they reach that river and someone asked them, are you an Ephraimite, they're going to say no, they can. They had uh, accused the Gileadites with uh, working against their country, and now they suffer an infirmity, particular to their own country, being that they don't pronounce shibboleth the same way. And they had also called the Gileadites unjustly fugitives. And now they themselves in their retreat are really and truly fugitives. In fact, in verse 5 there, he uses the same word when he speaks of their retreat. And then in verse 7, we come to the end of Jephthah's government. He judged Israel just six years and then passed away. And this brings us to the last part of the chapter, uh, verses 8 to 15, in which we will learn of three other judges that come after Jephthah.
Anyone have any comments or questions or anything so far? Very good. Fantastic. So starting in verse 8 to verse 15. And after him, as Jephthah, Ibzan of Bethlehem judged Israel. And he had 30 sons and 30 daughters, and he sent abroad, and took in 30 daughters from abroad for his sons. And he judged Israel seven years. Then died Ibzan, and was buried at Bethlehem. After him, Ebon, a Zebulonite, judged Israel, and he judged Israel ten years. And Ebon the Zebulonite died, and was buried in Ajalon, in the country of Zebulun. And after him, Abdon, the son of Hillel, he is a uh, Parathonite, judged Israel. And he had forty years, he had forty sons, and thirty nephews that rode on three score and ten ass colts, and he judged Israel eight years. And Abdon, the son of Hillel, the Barathonite, died, and was buried in Parathon, in the land of Ephraim, in the mound of the Amalekites. So we'll finish out the chapter with three judges who didn't have such great upheavals in their times, it seems. There's a short account of their reign. One seven years, second ten, and the third eight. Proverbs 28 and verse 2 tells us that for the transgression of the land, many are the princes thereof. But by a man of understanding and knowledge, the state thereof shall be prolonged. Uh, they went to their judges relatively fast and regularly, and then they would falter. Good men being removed at the beginning of their usefulness by the time they begin to apply themselves. First one we have is Ibzan of Bethlehem. Ruled this seven years, but seems to have uh, lived long enough by the number of his children and the fact that he saw them all married. He had many children, 60 in all, which is remarkable for him. He had an equal number of each sex as well. Quite remarkable. 30 sons, 30 daughters. Took care to marry them all. His daughters he sent abroad, and he took in 30 daughters from abroad from his sons. He must have been a major contributor to uh, immigration and immigration <laughs> in, in his tribe at that time. Then comes Elon of Zebulun uh, in the north of Canaan. He was raised up and administered justice, reformed abuses as they do. Ten years he did it, a blessing to Israel, and then died. Verse 11 and 12. And lastly, Abdon of the tribe of Ephraim succeeded. Uh, he came from that illustrious tribe, that tribe now beginning to recover its reputation, having not afforded any person of note since Joshua. Really. Abdon was famous for his offspring, 40 sons and 30 grandsons or nephews, depending on who you read. Uh, they rode on 70 ass colts. That could indicate that they were judges and officers under him or gentlemen, persons of distinction. There's no taken of where all of them were buried. In verse 7 and 10, 12 and 15, it says where they are, uh, perhaps because of the inscriptions there upon monuments that could serve for instruction and for confirmation of their story, that those coming after would go there and look at the monument to see what it was a monument to. Peter, uh, speaking of David, in Acts 2 and verse 29 says, his sepulchre is with us to this day. Now, it could be intended to honor the place where they've laid them to rest as well. Also, it shows us uh, a lesson 
and not attaching ourselves too much to the esteem of worldly glory, even that brought us by the Lord, because death and the grave will be the end of that worldly glory. We can go into the true glory with our Lord in our next life. And that is the end of that chapter and the end of the story uh, of Jephthah. Chapter 13. We begin the story of Samson. Now, I want to read first from Hebrews, chapter 11 and 32, because I keep referring to these people as being spoken of in Hebrews, so we might as well get the verse from Hebrews out here somewhere. Hebrews, chapter 11, verse 32. And what shall I more say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and of Barak and of Samson and of Japheth, of David also and Samuel and of the prophets. These being a list of those great men of faith known from years before. Now, the history of the rest of the judges starts from their advancement to their station. They're chosen as a judge and given the Spirit of God. In this case, it's quite different. We don't find Samson, head of a court or an army, upon the throne of judgment, the field of battle. But he's a great patriot and a great scourge against the enemies of Israel. You know. And his history doesn't start, as I said, with him being brought up. It starts before he's even born, when an angel from heaven actually comes to uh, usher him into the world and to give his parents uh, foreknowledge that they would have this child and that he would be great. Afterwards, we find John the Baptist and our Lord Christ himself, both accompanied by such angelic visitations. So we're starting in verse 1 to 7 of chapter 13. Does somebody like to read or read? 1 to 7. And the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord. And the Lord delivered them into the hand of the Philistines four years. And there was a certain man of Zorah, of the family of the Danites, whose name was Manoah, and his wife was barren and bare not. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto the woman, and said unto her, Behold now, thou art barren, and bearest not, but thou shalt conceive, and bear a son. Now therefore beware, I pray thee, and drink not wine nor strong drink, and eat not any unclean thing. For lo, thou shalt conceive and bear a son, and no razor shall come on his head. For the child shall be a Nazarite unto God from the womb, and he shall begin to deliver Israel out of the hand of the Philistines. Then the woman came and told her husband, saying, A man of God came unto me, and his countenance was like the countenance of an angel of God, very terrible. But I asked him not whence he was, neither told him his name. But he said unto me, Behold, thou shalt conceive and bear a son, and now drink no wine nor strong drink, neither eat any unclean thing. For the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb to the day of his death. So, to begin with, everyone, say it with me, they did evil in the sight of the Lord. God will then deliver them into the hands of their enemies. If there hadn't been any sin, they wouldn't have needed a Savior. But uh, sin was allowed to abound, so the grace could more so. The enemies of God uh, that they were sold to here were the Philistines. Uh, the Philistines were uh, 
first or chief of the nation devoted to destruction. Back in chapter 3, 1, it says, though, that God left them to prove the Israelites. In Judges 3, we read, Now these are the nations which the Lord left to prove Israel by them, even as many of Israel had not known the wars of Canaan. And in verse 3, namely, five wars of the Philistines, all the Canaanites, and the Sidonians, and the Hivites that dwell in Mount Lebanon, from Mount Belahermon unto the entering of Hamath. So the Lord had people there uh, left because the Israelites had not cleared their land as they were supposed to, and used them to test the Israelites, both in their faith in keeping away from idolatry, which they wouldn't, and in their faith and repentance that they would turn to the Lord for his aid in putting these people off. Now, this trouble lasted longer than any had yet, 40 years. It might not have always been a hot war and violent, but they were always under oppression. Israel was in this distress. Samson is born, and we have the birth foretold by the angel. Now, about Samson. He's of the tribe of Dan, as in verse 2. Dan signifies a judge or judgment. Back in Genesis 30, in verse 6. And Rachel said, God hath judged me, and hath also heard my voice, and hath given me a son. Therefore, called she his name Dan. And there is the tribe of Dan. Uh, Jacob foretold that Dan shall judge his people. Genesis 49 and 16, Dan shall judge his people as one of the tribes of Israel. And here we have Samson, one of the best known and greatest judges, coming from Dan. So Jacob may well have prophesied with an eye to that at the time. Now, Dan lays next to the country of the Philistines. So that tribe is quite fit to fight the Philistines off as lying between them and the rest of Israel. Of his parents, they have been childless a long time. No children, appearing to be barren. There are a lot of eminent people we find in the Bible that are born of mothers that are kept in want for a great while. The, the delay of their blessing is a preface to the greatness of their blessing. Isaac is one, Joseph is one, Samuel is one, John the Baptist is one. And so we see these parallels, all of these, with uh, Samson. So, we now come to the what? Tidings are brought to the mother that she's going to have a son. The messenger's an angel in verse 3 there, but he appears as a man, like a prophet. And the angel delivers this message. He, he takes notice of her affliction. Thou art barren, bearest not. And though, and uh, so she gathers that he's a prophet, as he can tell her this. He assures her that she is going to conceive and bear. In verse 3, he repeats that assurance in verse 5. A lot of women, having long been barren, have born a sword of a son by providence. But here we're going to have one born by promise. He's been given the announcement that he promises beforehand. Uh, this makes him a figure of that promised seed uh, so long expected. Our Lord. Then he appoints that the child will be a Nazarite from birth that his mother should be subject to the law of the Nazarite, to drink no wine or strong drink as long as the child will have his nourishment from her, either at her breast or in her womb. Other judges uh, had corrected their faith in their own apostasies from God 
But Samson here is going to appear more than any of them as consecrated to God from his birth. In number six in verse two, we read, speaking to the children of Israel, say unto them, when either man or woman shall separate themselves, to thou a vow of the Nazarite, to separate themselves unto the Lord. And so he is separated here from before his birth. Samuel is going to carry Israel's deliverance from the Philippines, being a Nazarite by his mother's vow. In 1 Samuel, uh, 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 11, and she vowed a vow and said, O Lord, of course, that thou wilt indeed look upon the affliction of thine handmaid and remember me, and not forget thine handmaid, but will give unto thine handmaid a man child, and I will give him unto the Lord all the days of his life, and there shall be no razor come upon his head. And the angel also foretells his service that the child should have. He's going to be set aside, he's going to be set aside to do something. And this is important that he says that he shall begin to deliver Israel. This uh, shows that the oppression of the Philistines is going to last a long time. Israel's deliverance isn't going to begin until this child who is still unborn will have grown up with the capacity of beginning it. And it also tells us that he's not going to complete that deliverance. He'll just begin to deliver Israel. The trouble is going to be prolonged. Herein, Samson is a type of Christ. Since some parallels all over being dedicated from birth, the, the Annunciation, you know, as a Nazarite to God, but a Nazarite in the womb. The Lord Jesus was a Nazarite himself, but he was typified by that, being pure from sin. He's a deliverer of Israel, Samson is, as Jesus delivers his people from their sins. What's the difference? Samuel just began deliver Israel. David was afterwards to complete that. Our Lord Jesus is both Samson and Davis to us. He is the author and the finisher of our faith. Now, uh, Manoah's wife, quite happy at this news, brings the report to her husband in verses 6 and 7. She says that the messenger was a man of God. Doesn't describe him exactly, but that, that he was all inspiring. Would you like to point it? Uh, can't give a name or what tribe or city he's from, but boy, was this guy a prophet. And then she speaks of the message that he gave. She gives him an account of the promise to her and the precepts for her behavior thereafter. Uh, he now can believe the promise along with her, that they can be a pair of believers. And he might also, on occasion, uh, help monitor her to observe the precepts of the Nazarite. Uh, those who are yoked together should communicate with each other whenever they have communion with God improved their acquaintance with God, let them share this acquaintance with one another, that they are in a health to one another. Now we come to 8 to 14, and we'll at least read it and talk about it a little bit. Okay. Starting in verse 8 of chapter 13. Then Manoah entreated the Lord and said, O oh my Lord, let the man of God which thou didst send, come again unto us, and teach us what we shall do unto the child that has been born. And God hearkened to the voice of Manoah, and the angel of God came again unto the woman, and she sat in the field. But Manoah, her, her husband, was not with her. 
And the woman made haste and ran and showed her husband and said unto him, Behold, the man hath appeared unto me that come unto me the other day. And Manoah arose and went after his wife and came to the man and said unto him, Art thou the man that spakest unto the woman? And he said, I am. And Manoah said, Now let thy word come to pass. How shall we order the child, and how shall we do unto him? And the angel of the Lord said unto Manoah, Of all that I said unto the woman, let her beware. She may not eat of anything that cometh of the vine, neither bitter drink wine or strong drink, nor eat any unclean thing. All that I commanded her, let her observe. So here's a second visit. The angel of God makes to Manoah and his wife. Manoah prays for this visit earnestly in verse 8. Now, he takes it for granted that that child that's promised is going to come to them. He says without hesitation, the child that shall be born, he calls it. Now, you can't find that good of faith in Zechariah who was waiting at the altar of the Lord when the angel himself, angel of the Lord himself appeared to him. Uh, as it said, blessed are those that have not seen and yet have believed. Now, what they want to know is, what Manoah wants to know, is what they should do with this child that should be born. When we're giving this blessing to God, what do we do with it? Good men desire more to know their duty, what they're supposed to do, what should be done by them, than to know what events are going to occur to them. Solomon, in Ecclesiastes, asked what good men should do, not what they should have. So he prays to God to send this same blessed messenger again to give them further instructions concerning the management of their soon-to-be Nazarite. We have ministers of the gospel, men, who, who bring the word to us properly for our instruction, and we should ask the Lord to send them to us, to teach us, leaders and teachers. As in Romans 15 and verse 30, Now I beseech you, brethren, for the Lord Jesus Christ's sake and for the love of the Spirit, that ye strive together with me in your prayers to God for me. And in verse 32, That I might come unto you with joy by the will of God, and may with you be refreshed. So God grants it. They pray for the direction, and God hearkens to Manoah's voice in verse 9. Good and upright is the Lord, says Psalm 25 in verse 8. Therefore he will teach sinners in the way. The meek will he guide in judgment, and the meek will he teach his way. Who will he teach the way to? Sinners. If you've really messed up, don't run away from God during his wrath. Run toward him. That's the way to go. <laughs> because he will take care of you when you confess, repent, and ask him. So the angel appears a second time to the wife. She's out sitting alone in the field, maybe tending the flocks. Good people uh, are never less alone than when they're alone. If God is with them. It's good to spend a little time alone, just you and your Lord. She goes to her husband as quick as she can, uh, asks the messenger to stay there most likely, and then returns with her husband, verse 10, 11. And uh, these people, like the lady here, who are acquainted with the things of God themselves, need to invite others to the same acquaintance. Whenever you're given wisdom, 
or given a blessing, or a prophecy of such. In John 1 and verse 45, we read that Philip findeth Nathanael, and said unto him, We have found him, of whom Moses and the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathanael said unto him, Can there any good thing come out of Nazareth? And Philip said unto him, Come and see. When you see, you would bring others to come and see, as she did. Now, Manoah comes to the angel, is satisfied that it's the same one that appeared to his wife, and then with humility, he welcomes the promise that we're given. Now let thy words come to pass. What is the will of God given by what he pleases and prophet now? Let it come to pass. This is uh, an idea of desire that he'll have this son, but also of faith that God's given it to him. In Luke 1 and 38, Mary said, Behold the handmaiden of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. And the angel departed from her. And then he asked that the prescription, what they should do with their blessing, would be repeated. How shall we order this child? And here is showing that the utmost care of both parents is needed. A joint endeavor. A joint endeavor. Uh, I don't know. The good raising of children, bringing them up in the way, devoted to God, brought up for Him, that isn't just one person putting that off in the other. But they should both do their best. That is why it's very bad to be unequally yoked when one is a believer and one is not. For well, the two parents together should both pay the utmost attention to the raising of the child. Well, now, Manoah makes his uh, inquiry, and we find here that when God bestows a mercy on us, we should take care about how to use it for his glory. God gave us bodies, souls, our estate in this world, and now how are we going to use them? We should ask him. Uh, we need to answer to his intent and give a good account of how we use these things. Those to whom God has given children, as in this case, should be careful what they do with them. Train them up in the way where they should go. Pious parents will ask divine assistance for this. And then, at the last, the angel repeats the directions he gave before. In verse 13 and 14, everything he forbid to her, let her be aware of that, and all that he commanded, let her observe that. She doesn't need any unclean thing. Those are in Christ, when Christ is born in us, and we are given that spirit in us, must cleanse ourselves in flesh and spirit. Don't do anything that's going to prejudice that new man we're becoming. And as an aside here, before we close, dietary restrictions are really common, both in people who are newly faithful and have just got into it, and in the zealous. Although they're not necessarily deep in the faith yet, but, uh, their zeal will bring them to try and be pure. And uh, it is a symbol therein that they will put off certain foods. Happens over and over. And it reminds me of Augustine of Hippo, I think it was. St. Augustine recalls being a saint, and of course believing himself to be the greatest sinner on earth as most saints do. 
recalls in his youth how stupid and bigoted he was. Because in his youth, he was a member of a little group of uh, religious zealots who were very pure, who prayed all the time, who didn't look at the wrong things, didn't say the wrong things, didn't think the wrong things, didn't eat the wrong things. In fact, they only ate like fruit and nuts and berries and groats and stuff. And, you know, they'd gone full into that. And he recalls when he was a young man how he used to take some of the fruits, and, and when he saw people who were uh, degenerates on the street and called them out for it, he and the other young man would throw the fruits at them <laughs> in order to uh, both ask and embarrass them. And he recalls uh, uh, what a, a uh, annoying and uh, uh, unthinking and uh, what little introspection and self-knowledge he had at the time. Well, he was trying to be so pure, but his uh, behavior had gone toward vanity instead. Not that there's anything against being a vegetarian. Just, just don't throw it at the other guy because he's not part of your sect, you know? <laughs> but that just reminded me of Augustine. And that is going to be the end of uh, our Bible study for tonight. And we will get into the rest of the beginning of the account of uh, Samson next time. So let us ask the Lord to bless our going out. Father God, thank you for this time we have had in your living word. I ask you, Lord, as we go out, that you will be with all those out there on the road, all those listening in uh, the YouTube channel, or those who listen later to the archives. I ask that you protect those on the road from all dangers, both physical and spiritual, that you send your angel before them to trip every trap of the enemy, and that you will kindle that spirit in our hearts that leads us to a love of your word and will keep us in your word every day not just on the special days of Bible study or Sunday services. And Lord, I ask that you will bring us back again, both ourselves here in the chapel now, and more that could come to our door in person, that we might serve them in the name of your Lord Jesus Christ. And most of all, I'm here to thank you for that same Jesus that Christ be bought our salvation through faith in him. And in Jesus' name I pray, and amen. And that's the end of our Bible study for this Thursday. We'll be back again at 7.30 next week.
I'm not afraid.